One of the mysteries to me is why other academics find it so difficult to define fantasy literature. I mean, ordinary people have no difficulty at all in defining the term. When I, when I do my classes, um, I've, I've often done this experiment. I go into the class and I ask the students, I give them two minutes to come up with any terms that they associate with fancy literature, and they always come up with the same thing. They come up with swords, they come up with magic, they come up with secondary worlds, they come up with rings, they come up with kings, they come up with evil things, you know, they come up with all of these things all the time. They, they, they obviously have a very clear idea um, about what fancy literature means to them at the beginning of the 21st century. So why do academics have to complicate things? So my definition uh, of fantasy um, is, is reader-led. I use these definitions, I use these people's ideas about fantasy um, to come up with my own definition of fantasy literature. Firstly, fantasy is characterised by secondary spaces, um, alternative worlds that um, exist beyond uh, the reality of our own world. And it can be, there's a variety of um, secondary worlds that fantasy offers. Um, it offers wholly separate worlds, um, as you find in Tolkien, um, or that you find in Terry Pratchett, um, or that you find in some of China Mierville, like in his Last Lag series. Um, it can also be a parallel world, so a world that runs parallel to our own, so you find this uh, in something like C.S. Lewis. Um, or in Philip Pullman's His Dark Material series, um, or it, it can sometimes be um, a secondary space that is, is a kind of extension of our own world. So you, you would find this in something like Harry Potter would be the best example of that, or something like Alan Garner as well. Um, so that's the first characteristic, and this, I, this existence of a secondary space. Um, the second uh, part of my definition is to do with how this secondary space is constructed. Um, so I theorise that the secondary space is um, always divided into two parts. Um, I call one part of this the, the pragmaticos, um, the real, and the other part of this is the allos, the, the other of the secondary world. So the pragmatic course is essentially um, the diegetic reality of the secondary space. So it's all the things that go to make up the reality of that secondary space. So it's the places, it's the people, it's the creatures, it's the social structures, it's the languages, it's the laws, it's the technology, it's the food and drink, it's everything like that. Um, fancy writers are very, very concerned to have metaphysical consistency. So in other words, they construct their secondary space as real. And this is very, very important to them. It's one of the basic criteria of fancy, of, uh, fancy literature is that the secondary space must be consistent. It must be real. The important thing is, in my uh, theorization of fantasy, the allos is part of the pragmatic cost part of the pragmaticos, it's subsumed in the uh, pragmaticos. So um, for an example, to show you how these things go together, um, Chana Mierville in his Baslag series, um, he has a race of creatures called Kepri. So Kepri are part of the pragmaticos because they're, they're part of the reality of the Baslag universe. Um, they have their own language, they have their own culture, they have their own food. Um, they're integrated into human culture, so they're, they're part of the pragmatic cost of this world. But of course they're allos as well. They're, they're humans but with insect heads. Um, they communicate through chemical sprays. Um, they sculpt statues out of spit. So, so clearly they're, they're, they're real in this universe that they're part of, but also uh, so they're, they're part of the pragmatic cost but they're allos in the sense that they're entirely alien to us, they're imaginary creations um, that exist as part of this fantasy world. So, um, in my definition of fantasy, fantasy is always backwards looking. 
things. So in other words, to be a fancy text, um, the technology which is available in the secondary space um, is always less advanced than the technology that you find in, in our own world. So it's, it's one way of uh, differentiating fantasy from, from science fiction. Um, so, for, for example, in Philip Pullman's The Amber Spyglass, um, at the end of The Amber Spyglass there is a, a huge battle between good and evil. And Will, the hero, supposedly it's a universal battle uh, between all the worlds that have ever existed um, and they're fighting uh, for, for good and for evil. But this, this, this battle is fought with bows and arrows, right? It's fought with swords and knives. So if Will can call upon any world that's ever existed, I mean, why doesn't he call upon the Marines? Why doesn't he call in the Marines to actually help them win this battle? Well, of course he can't because uh, Pullman is writing a fancy text. So a fancy text does not allow that level of technology to enter into it. And if it does, it no longer becomes a fancy text. Well, it, it's a new theorization of fantasy because no one theorizes fantasy synchronically. Everyone theorizes fantasy diachronically. So their definitions of fantasy are far too broad to ever have such a narrow definition as I have because the text that they look at and include within the fantasy genre, um, they don't operate in this way. But then they are so disparate that it's hard to actually see any correlations between them at all. So if you're theorizing fantasy diachronically and you include everything from Hamlet because it has ghosts up to 120 days of Sodom because it's, it's a kind of fantasy, a sexual fantasy that takes place in a kind of imaginary space, then how do you actually, how do you actually theorize that? Because there's no, no, nothing in common between the texts. So my definition of fantasy, I look at texts which have something in common um, and which readers understand them to be fantasy texts and they understand that they're fantasy texts because they have these things in common. So in, in, the, ordinary, in the eyes of the ordinary reader, there's no question that Tolkien is fantasy. There's no question that C.S. Lewis is fantasy. There's no question that Harry Potter is fantasy. All of these texts have something in common and what I'm trying to do is theorise that thing that they have in common. So what do they have in common? The most obvious thing that they have in common is that they have a secondary space, constructed in a slightly different way in each case, but they all have secondary spaces. And the other thing that they have in common is that in the secondary space, these secondary spaces are constructed as real. So we're meant to believe in them as a real alternative space. Um, and they all contain all of these um, spaces, they all contain elements which are beyond um, the experiences of our own world. So they all contain things which are simply not a part of our world, but which are real within these, within these spaces. I mean, it, it, it's obvious what they have in common, in fact, but, but nobody has ever, ever theorised it like that. So what I'm, what I'm trying to do is theorise it in that way and look at the relationship between these two things. Because this is what makes fantasy different, is that you have these two things. You have on the one hand, you have a world constructed as real, and on the other hand, you have in that real world, you have things which are clearly not real. And that allows fantasy to operate in ways which other texts can't operate, because the reality of the text allows parallelism of our own world, so things like satire can operate. Um, but it also has the imaginary elements, which means that um, it, it can operate, it can, it can look our own look at our own world imaginatively as well and explore something like concepts, uh, abstract concepts um, in, in our world in a way which other texts cannot do. So, so something like in Terry Pratchett he looks at belief, belief is an abstract concept but in Small Gods uh, belief is a real thing, it's a real thing. So, so he can explore this idea of belief because of, the, because, of the al because of the alos, because he can look at it imaginatively and in his world belief can be a real thing so you can look at it in a totally different way from um, how other genres of literature can actually explore, explore this concept.